the world, and hello, Squirrely Squad. Thanks for checking out the show today, which was released a day early. (laughs) More on that later. I'm your host, Squirrels, of course. We chat about games, tech, music, comics, the whole nine yards, family-friendly, trying to share some encouragement, too. This is episode number two. (laughs) Let's check it out. So before we start things off, this is usually where I mention our new Twitch subs and patrons from last week, but I only streamed one day, (laughs) Um, and uh, alas, no one new today to mention to y'all. So maybe next week? Reminder though, if you watch me on Twitch, subscribers get the channel's unique squirrely emotes, of course, these shoutouts on the show, um, and uh, other benefits that kind of vary... You know, as as the weeks go by, they 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 come in and out and change up. Uh, Squirrely patrons, of course, get these shout outs as well, but also get exclusive videos, early access to YouTube content, uh, free gifts. If you're in that top tier um, patrons, uh, you'll they'll also see free public visibility blog updates, all things Squirrely, where I'm at, in my travels, those types of things. Um, yeah, basically the only place I'm really blogging right now is on that Patreon page. <laughs> so yeah, huge shout out to, uh, well, huge thank you to all of those that support these efforts in any way. Listeners, viewers, lurkers, and the like. And a special thank you to those supporting financially. All right, let's get into the news. All right, so first up in the gaming section here in my notes, we've got something from Eurogamer. Sony is plotting a big push into mobile gaming. With the biggest PlayStation games key to the effort, a job advertisement for head of mobile PlayStation Studios SIE reveals plans for the successful candidate to focus on successfully adapting PlayStation's most popular franchises for mobile. And this is a quote, you will be responsible for building and scaling a team of mobile leaders and will serve as the head of this new business unit within PlayStation Studios, end quote. So what should we expect? Well, PlayStation's most popular franchises include Naughty Dog's Uncharted and The Last of Us series, uh, Polyphony's Gran Turismo, so- uh, Sony Santa Monica's God of War, the Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank, etc., etc. Perhaps we'll see some mobile iterations as a result of this new push. Don't hold your breath, though. This job ad says a roadmap will need to be developed for a three to five year time frame. PlayStation, of course, guys, has PlayStation Mobile Inc. already and published numerous games over the years, right? On a PS Remote Play app, on PC, Xperia Play once upon a time. So uh, so this isn't news that PlayStation, that Sony PlayStation is, you know, in the mobile gaming market at all, right? This is, But this is kind of interesting news in the fact that, um, that we're... We were talking last week a bit about the strides that Xbox is making in the mobile and cloud gaming market um, and a little bit of rumor and hearsay around what PlayStation could be doing in the future around those same subject matter. This is interesting because this looks like they're straight up looking for people to hire uh, to to push in that uh, in that foray. So. I'm looking forward to to finding out in the coming weeks and months uh, any particular announcements that may unfold from Sony PlayStation, but I don't know how soon those will be since this is literally saying in the uh, the job advertisement that um, that it's looking for a three to five year uh, roadmap to be planned out. Like they don't even have a roadmap yet; they're planning a roadmap, and that roadmap will be a three to five year one. So. Yeah, like the article says, don't hold your breath, but um, interesting to note that Sony is looking to, to hire some folks for a mobile push of some kind. Next article here is from The Verge. Gigabyte announces three new 4K gaming monitors. The excerpt reads as follows. Gigabyte has announced three new 4K gaming monitors for its Aorus brand. 
Each features HDMI 2.1, the somewhat hard-to-find display connector that allows for high refresh rate gaming at 4K. Besides having some of the best tech available in TVs or monitors, all three have desk-dominating sizes. According to a press release posted by Video Cards, with a Z, the monitors will also feature VESA's HDR1000 standard and come in three sizes. 32 inch, 43 inch, and a mind boggling, more on that in a second, 48 inches. The 48 inch, the 48 inch model, dubbed FO48U, is slightly different from the other two. Besides dropping the refresh rate from 144 hertz to 120 hertz, it's also the size of a TV more at home in an entertainment center. Specifically, the 48-inch model of LG's CX OLED TVs, which shares many of the same specs as Gigabyte's version, from the HDMI 2.1 inputs to the 120Hz refresh rate. And despite calling it a, quote, monitor, it doesn't seem like Gigabyte expects many people to use this on a desk. Its website specifically says it's for your gaming space or living room. Kind of funny um, that it looks like uh, they're taking a page from LG here, um, but kind of cool, right? Like we've got, you know, you, you can't really complain when you've got more um, fast refresh rate gaming uh, screen options uh, available on the market, right? More options available to pick from. Um, kind of cool though, uh, 2.1 HDMI here and uh, that big one, 48 inch. Could you imagine having a 48 inch on your on your desk? For PC gaming? Yeah. Gigabyte can't imagine that either, and that's why they expect it to probably be in your living room, probably for your, like, Xbox or PlayStation, especially with the new gen of consoles, right? So if you are in the market for a new living room TV, specifically for gaming, then maybe check out Gigabyte's new brand here, or G Gigabyte's new... Um, um, model or series here but if you are looking for something on your desk the 32 inch or even the 43 inch depending on the size of your desk could do it 32 is kind of getting on the on the big side for a desk unless you've only got the one monitor um, if you're doing any kind of multi-monitor setup then i don't know what uh what sizes you guys max out at right now my middle monitor of my three is a 25 inch 4k um, the, the left and the right flank monitors are both 20 inches. Um, they're not really high def. I think they're, these ones are just 1600 by 900 monitors, but, um, uh, but they do the job. They get it done nicely. Well, at least the left one does. My right monitor hasn't been working since like December. <laughs> um, I'll replace it one of these days, maybe with a gigabyte one. Probably not the, uh, probably not though. 32 inches, uh, is a little big for, for my taste, but 32, 48 inch, or 43 inch, and 48 inch, 120 hertz refresh rate, kind of cool. Check those out from Gigabyte, or check out their competitor, apparently from LG. <laughs> the next story here: OBS gets native support for Nvidia's excellent noise canceling tech. This excerpt comes from The Verge. Open Broadcaster Software, OBS for short, the go-to software for streamers, it's the one that I'm using right now, in fact, side note, is getting native support for NVIDIA's excellent noise removal technology. The graphics card manufacturer announced that today, and I say today, but I think this was from a few days ago now. Although it was previously possible to get the same effect by combining OBS with NVIDIA's broadcast software... You'll now be able to adjust the background noise removal feature directly from within OBS. It's currently available with the beta version of OBS Studio 27 and will be coming in a full release soon. NVIDIA's noise removal technology has been around for a little while, first as RTX Voice and then as one of the features built into NVIDIA Broadcast. The AI-powered tool can cancel out everything from keyboard clacking to your PC's loud fans. It's a great addition to the streamer's arsenal, helping to filter out distracting background noise so viewers can focus on game audio and a streamer's commentary. The new integration arrived with NVIDIA's latest game-ready driver, which also adds support for Mortal Shell's, Mortal Shell's RTX update, as well as six new G-Sync compatible displays. 
This is pretty cool. I use a combination of different noise cancellations today. Um, when I'm streaming, um, I use a combination of a built-in noise canceller into voice meter, uh, banana, which, um, I'm going to talk to, uh, well, actually this week is the plan. Um, so, you know, hold me to that folks, hold me to that squirrely squad. Um, hit me up in the DMS. If I didn't post those on YouTube this week, I should be though. I got to finish recording them and editing them, but they should be up this week. Um, but a combination between voice meter bananas, noise cancellation, uh, or noise gate as those in the industry are more familiar with that term. Um, as well as, um, as well as a minor noise gate on my zoom R24, um, audio mixer interface. Um, so I use a combination of two different noise gates. The reason I do that is the, the Zoom R24, I honestly don't have a way of uh, detecting how much noise cancellation is actually happening. Uh, it's a very rudimentary mixer. Um, so I use it very, very, very sparingly. Um, I use it until I don't see a static indicator anymore. But uh, things are still getting picked up, and that's very clear because when I look at voice meter banana, I can still see some some input in the dB level range. So I use the noise gate on voice meter banana to try to mitigate as much of that as I possibly can without ruining what the audio quality actually sounds like. Um, and I can talk to a bit of that, um, or I will be talking a bit to that um, on the YouTube channel mini series that. Um, or um, that we've been doing uh, streaming with squirrels where I essentially have been talking about various tips and tricks and things that I've learned when it comes to live streaming um, as well as I'll be venturing out into more of the content creation subject matter as a whole and, and, and more broader range there um, which is what this series is actually going to be on um, more on the audio aspect of it um, tips and tricks on how to get a, a decent sounding audio in your streams or on your YouTube videos or Instagram videos or whatever you may be doing and may be into. Now that said, getting back to the article here, it's really cool for those that actually have the NVIDIA RTX uh, graphics cards um, because they have that NVIDIA software kind of built in. I don't 100% know exactly how the software works. I don't know if there's a microphone in the graphics card or what that's kind of detecting that background noise. I imagine it's got to be something probably similar to that because typically graphics cards operate pretty independently from your audio, right? They're typically just responsible for the video stuff and things. So I'm not really sure um, how it works. Um, but you know, it's been around ever since RTX pretty much came out with RTX voice. And then, like they said, with NVIDIA's own broadcasting software. So it is nice to see that you don't have to run two broadcasting softwares in tandem if you want to take advantage of that RTX feature. So for those of you that have an RTX board, I actually saw one in the airport on my way home, uh, this past week. It was kind of cool. It was kind of random too, actually. The guy in front of me in the security checkpoint um, when I was leaving uh, the Charleston airport, the guy in front of me had a gaming PC that he was taking as his carry-on. Never seen that one before. But yeah, he had his full desktop computer. Um, it was a, it was a, um, it was not a full-size ATX. It was probably a mid-size ATX case, but he was carrying it through security checkpoint, put it on the uh, on the conveyor belt. Uh, but anyway, he had an RTX uh, 2060 in his, I think it was uh, an MSI uh, MSI brand RTX 2060. Um, but, uh, but that was kind of interesting to see. So if you do happen to be one of those folks out there that is using an RTX NVIDIA graphics card and would like to take advantage of that feature, well, behold, it's now native um, in the latest OBS studio. All right, that's all we've got in the gaming realm. I know that wasn't a ton of gaming news there. Um, I, uh, I usually try to do a better job of seeing what I can find out in the world of gaming. But uh, we've got a couple news articles here uh, from, uh, from tech right now. So in the tech category... Google is removing its Play Movies and TV app from every Roku and most smart TVs. This comes from The Verge. The Google Play Movies and TV apps 
will no longer be available on any Roku set-top box or any Samsung, LG, Vizio, or Roku smart TV starting July 15th, Google has announced. If you have movies or TV shows purchased or rented through the service, you'll still be able to access them through the Your T- Movies and TV Shows section of the YouTube app on those devices. This change will also affect you if you used movies and TV apps to access movies anywhere, the service that allows you to redeem codes from DVDs and Blu-rays so you can access your media digitally. Google has confirmed to The Verge that users who relied on Play Movies and TV to access your content will be able to do so through YouTube. So it sounds like they're just trying to do some consolidation effort here. Uh, Play Movies and the Google TV apps um, were probably just not used nearly as uh, as much as they thought they'd be used or as much as they maybe hoped that they would be used in comparison to YouTube. And of course, since Google owns YouTube, it only made sense to sooner or later just transition everything into a single platform, single pane of glass, if you will. So it sounds like they're just consolidating and moving play movies and TV from Google into a single app as YouTube. So depending on what systems you're using, what TVs you're using, you may have to use a browser or use a native YouTube app, but you just go to the section entitled Your Movies and Shows, which will be added if it's not there already, and that's where you would find what you would normally be watching on Google Play Movies and Google TV. Makes sense to me, honestly. Um, This doesn't really affect me too much, but if you're out there and it does affect you, this is an FYI. Starting July 15th, those apps will be consolidated into your respective YouTube Uh, methods of watching. Next article here, Microsoft announces Surface Laptop 4 with choice of Intel or AMD processors. This one's really cool. At least I thought it was kind of cool. This comes from The Verge as well. Microsoft is refreshing its Surface lineup with the Surface Laptop 4 today, which now offers the choice between AMD or Intel processors across both the 13.5-inch and the 15-inch models. Both sizes will ship with Intel's latest 11th-gen processors or AMD's Ryzen 4000 series processors. Microsoft is shipping its Surface Laptop 4 on April 15th in the U.S., Canada, and Japan, starting at $999 for the AMD model, and $12.99 for the Intel version, a $300 price gap between the pair. The difference in pricing likely comes down to the fact that Microsoft isn't using AMD's latest 5000 series CPUs here. Instead, Microsoft is using AMD's Zen 2-based chips for the AMD Ryzen Surface Edition processors. Despite this, performance between the Intel and AMD versions could be rather similar, but we'll have to wait for the full reviews to judge how Microsoft's choices have landed. It's interesting here because I've always found that AMD's last gen processors tend to be pretty decent in performance compared to Intel's latest gen. That is obviously not always the case. It's hit or miss between desktop and mobile particularly, but um, but generally speaking, last gen to this gen, AMD versus Intel um, respectively, uh, they measure pretty decent to each other. Um, And on top of the fact that AMD is typically cheaper overall compared to Intel, um, that has been less and less true in recent years, of course, as AMD is gaining gaining steam um, and popularity and making partnerships like this with Microsoft. Um, which is pretty interesting and cool that you can even have that option. Of course, you you were able to have the option like with Dell in the past as well with uh, with a- with Alienware, um, and uh, you were able to put Alienware processors in there. Um, but um, it was still uh, it was still favored heavily by Intel, right? Um, and the fact that there's only a three hundred dollar price gap between last gen's AMD and this gen's Intel strikes me as interesting as well. Um, It's a little odd. Like, I would have expected that price gap to be a little bit bigger, Um, but uh, but I don't know. Um, 
I guess it also depends, you know, on what the RAM looks like and what the drives look like on the insides, you know, compare those specs with each other as well and what they're actually getting. Um, um, I'd be interested in the motherboard as well, but I don't think they typically release those specs. You kind of have to, to dig around to find those, that type of information. But for those of you that are, you know, interested in the Surface Laptop series, the Surface Laptop 4 being announced with the option for AMD could be a, um, a less expensive way for you guys to get into that if you haven't yet. Um, personally, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Surface technology in general, at least in tablet form. Um, I had the Surface Pro Gen 1 when it was first announced and when it first came out many years ago now. Wow, yeah, like almost a decade ago now. Um, I guess we're going up on eight years, give or take. Um, yeah, I think it was 2012, 2011 time frame when uh, I got my first Surface Pro. Um, and I loved that thing. Uh, it was it was wonderful uh, for a while. And um, uh, after a few years, you know, the, the technology got a little outdated. I replaced it. Um, I can't remember if I replaced my Alienware 13 with a Surface Pro or if I replaced my Surface Pro with an Alienware 13. It's, it's kind of a blur now. Um, but nonetheless, it did get replaced. But years and years and years later, here we are. Last year, I've now had just a little over a year now, I've owned the, um, the Surface Pro 7, I believe it is. Um, so it's still the tablet one, not the laptop. But I love the thing. Um, of course, it's, uh, it's more of a laptop the way I use it with the attached keyboard. Um, but, I mean, you can detach that thing or just flip it around and use it as a tablet. Um, I have the Surface Pen with it, um, and I Photoshop draw with it. You guys have seen um, streams in the past where I've had Gotham on, and we've been drawing on my Surface in Photoshop. It's been a great time. Um, I was just using it last night, actually, to uh, to create some Squirrels graphics uh, for my phone wallpaper, <laughs> um, which... Um, is also a Surface now. Um, as of this past week, literally a few days ago, my Surface Duo came in the mail. Yes, the phone is a year old, I know. Um, but we just made a, a carrier change um, on our cell phone plan, and uh, I've been wanting to, to see what this Duo is all about. It does have mixed reviews. I mentioned that last week. But so far, folks, I've been loving this uh, this Surface Duo. Um, super, super productive. Um and it's not nearly as massive in my hand as I thought it was going to be. It's very lightweight. It's super thin. Um, I generally use, I've been using it the last couple days most um, in the full 360 flipped mode so that it's mostly like a, like a single screen phone. Um, but when I want the extra productivity, I just unfold it and use both screens accordingly. Um, it's been fantastic. Fits in my pockets just fine, folks. There's no issue with it. And what's cool is last night... Um, I tried using the Surface Pen with it. I didn't really do a ton of experimentation, but I did realize that the Surface Pen works beautifully with the Surface Duo, as you'd imagine. Um, so anyway, a little bit of a free advertisement for Microsoft there. Uh, I guess uh, going back to the point here, the Surface Laptop 4 was announced. AMD is an option. Check it out if you're into that. <laughs> All right. Moving into the entertainment section here of the news, we've got one, two, looks like three articles I've got planned out for you guys today. The first one here comes from comicbook.com. The Powerpuff Girls official first look revealed by the CW. It also came with character descriptions as well. Um, I don't have a ton to read from the article itself, the article itself aside from these character descriptions. Um, but yo, I didn't even realize Powerpuff Girls was having a live action TV show happening on the CW until I saw this article. Kind of nuts. Like what? What? Powerpuff Girls live action? How is that even going to work? I don't know. Um, but the character descriptions, um, are as you'd imagine here. So we've got Chloe Bennett as Blossom Utonium. Though she was a spunky, conscientious, little Miss Perfect child who holds several advanced degrees, Blossom's rep repressed Kindle superhero trauma has left her feeling anxious and reclusive, and she aims to become a leader again, this time on her own terms. Then we've got Dove Cameron as Bubbles Utonium. 
Bubbles' sweet girl disposition won America's heart as a child. She still sparkles as an adult, but her charming exterior bellies an unexpected toughness and wit. She's in in she's initially more interested in recapturing her fame than, si than saving the world, but she just might surprise us and herself. And then we've got Yana Peralt as Buttercup Utonium. Buttercup was the rebellious BA of the Powerpuff Girls in the heyday. More sensitive than her tough exterior suggests, Buttercup has spent her adulthood trying to shed her Powerpuff Girl identity and live an anonymous life. So it sounds like we've got um, like a sequel series of sorts, right? Like it sounds like this is going to be trailing their lives as adults. That part made me suddenly reinterested. Like if they were going to be like rebooting the Powerpuff series, but as live action, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like that would be goofy and not, I don't know, like uh, that just. That would hurt. There would be something inside of me that would just be like, nope, I'm, I would just, I would rather rewatch the, the original cartoon, which I wouldn't do anyway. But having watched Powerpuff Girls on and off as a kid, and now seeing that this is at them as an adult, well, it sounds like it's right up the CW alley, to be honest, right? All the drama, the drama and angst uh, of the CW TV shows. It sounds like Powerpuff Girls as an adult would uh, would work just fine and fit right in to the CW family. So, but uh, but anyway, the original article, the purpose of it wasn't just the descriptions; it was actually revealing the first look at the Powerpuff Girls. So do check that out. I saw this on ComicBook.com. I'm pretty sure every major news outlet now that would report on this, like IGN and all of them, would see it too. Just do a quick Google; you'll find them. Um, they're the it's basically just Chloe Bennett, Dove Cameron, and Yana Peralt with green, blue, and red backgrounds, honestly. But hey, you know, first look is a first look, right? <laughs> uh, also, uh, regarding the CW, the CW dropped last week the trailer for the second half of season one of Superman and Lois. So if you were watching that show, which I was, and it's a fantastic show, definitely recommend it. Uh, this does not fit the typical mold of the CW shows, by the way. Um, not, not to the fullest extent, anyway. I feel like Superman and Lois had a little bit better budget. Um, they've got uh, the the acting is definitely better in Superman and Lois than it has been traditionally in the other CW shows, including the rest of the Arrowverse shows. Production quality definitely seems to have been taken up a notch in comparison, especially to their cousin show. <laughs> pun intended there, Supergirl. Um, so, uh, so you can tell it's a, it just feels like a higher quality show overall. Um, the writing is definitely a bit better here uh, compared to the other Arrowverse shows and the other CW shows. Um, it's unfortunately that they had to take a mid-season hiatus um, and uh, Supergirl was kind of filled in there. We talked a bit about that last week. Uh, but they did release the trailer for the second half of the first season. So if you've been watching it or you're interested in where the show is going, check out that trailer. Next article here comes from IGN. Black Panther 2 producer rules out Chadwick Boseman cameo. The late Chadwick will not be making any sort of cameo, cameo appearance in Black Panther 2. This comes from Marvel Studios producer Nate Moore saying to Vanity Fair. And this is a quote here. No, I can say that is not going to happen. I would be honest if I was. Chad's passing is a whole life thing, and I love the guy as, as much as the character. I think we have, a very, we have to be very careful and thoughtful about when he appears because he meant so much to a lot of people as much as he meant to us. But yeah, we wouldn't use that as a come next week, maybe you'll see Panther. We wouldn't, and he's not. End quote. Late last year, Marvel Studios executive producer Victoria Alonso sum summarily dismissed the idea of using CG to recreate Bozeman. No, there's only one Chadwick, and he's not with us. Our king, unfortunately, has died in real life, not just in fiction, and we are taking a little time to see 
how we return to history and what we do to honor this chapter of what has happened to us that was so unexpected, so painful, so terrible, really. Alonzo said that in November. Since the actor's untimely death, the possibility of CG Bozeman has been in the back of many Marvel fans, especially considering Disney has previously used CG to resurrect the long-dead Peter Cushing as Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One, alongside a brief CG appearance of a young Princess Leia. Disney then used archival footage of actress Carrie Fisher to insert her into scenes in Star Wars, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, following her sudden death. The recently announced Wakanda TV series may give Marvel the room they need to explore other characters that could stand alongside Black Panther. Interesting, interesting, interesting. If any studio, if any film studio would have the the courage and, and the finances to fund an effort to CG an entire movie with Chadwick Moseman as Black Panther post his... Uh, passing it would be disney right like they have star wars they have marvel they are disney they have like every other practical broadcasting network you could think of it feels like these days seriously like if you haven't take some time and google every network or every organization or subsidiary that disney actually owns these days and it is a ton like every time like when they brought over they brought over fox right when they brought over fox they brought in a bunch of stuff under them um and uh, when they took over marvel of course they took over all of that like and lucasfilm and i mean it's just it's ridiculous take a look at it if you haven't but I think it's like 20 or 30 organizations, maybe more. I don't know, man. It's a lot. But, um, but if anyone had the ability to do it, it would be, you know, Disney. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, multiple people in this article have gone on record as of since like this November, it sounds like, have gone on record basically saying that they have no intention of recreating Chadwick for the Black Panther role. And since he didn't, since Black Panther, the character, didn't pass in the last time we saw him, the last film that we saw him in, how how is this going to work out from a story perspective without writing it off as, you know, a cheap way of writing off the character? I don't know. Like, um, but it'll be very interesting to see where, what direction they go in with this. You know, in the comics, I believe his sister has taken up the Black Panther Pan- uh, mantle the black panther mantle um but of course they could go in a multitude of other directions with it and uh, you know if the comics are their guide there are other options there i'm not as familiar with black panther lore as as some of you guys listening probably are um but you know uh but even if they don't they you know they're they're marvel disney they'll they'll do what they want at the end of the day and to be honest the vast majority of us are probably going to like it <laughs> I'm a DC fan at heart, uh, but uh, but I like both camps, uh, and uh, of course, it's uh, almost no one can truly argue that Marvel puts out the better superhero films in, in recent decades, right? So, so there's that. So, regardless of what they do and what direction is that they decide to go in, it'll probably be great. Next article here, last one I've got for you guys in the nerd news section here um, in entertainment. New photo teases Michael Keaton's Batmobile appearing in The Flash. This comes from We've Got We Got This Covered. There's been a ton of speculation regarding Michael Keaton's involvement in The Flash, despite the original big screen Bruce Wayne being announced for the project 10 months ago. Obviously, wow, wait, time out. It was 10 months ago when they announced that. It's been 10 months. Yo, this pandemic is making time fly. Back to the article here. Obviously, quite a lot has changed in the world since then, with the actor casting doubt on his participation as a veteran Batman due to scheduling conflicts and COVID-19 concerns. Muschietti admitted close to a year ago that Keaton would have a substantial role in the movie, so it could be a minor disaster if he doesn't end up making the trip across the Atlantic. However, a new photo may have teased that his preferred mode of transport is set to make an appearance regardless. This is a close-up picture. In this article, there's a close-up picture of the front end belonging to Keaton's Batmobile. 
which was posted online by Pictures Vehicles LTD, a United Kingdom-based custom-building effects team that have worked with Warner Brothers in the past, including productions based at The Flash's Leavesden Studios home. While it's far from a guarantee that it's going to make an appearance, if Tim Burton's Batman does commit to his role, then it makes perfect sense for his ride to get its moment in the sun to bathe in the warm glow of nostalgia. So, of course, this is more of rumor than official announcement, but it is definitely official that an image was released by that studio. So, while it's not necessarily a confirmation that he'll appear in the movie at this point, based on his late recent statements, or that the Batmobile will definitively be in the movie, it suggests pretty heavily that it could, uh, given all of the correlation that was discussed in this article. Um... So, kind of interesting. I, One way or another, I'm looking forward to this movie. As I mentioned in the previous article um, regarding Black Panther, at heart, I'm a big fan of DC. Not always a big fan of their movies, um, but even when people tend to not like their movies, I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt and see the good in the movies anyway. I do that with all movies, to be honest. So, you know, hate me if you want, but you could think that a million movies were bad and I'll probably like some part of them anyway. <laughs> That's just how I am. So I'm looking forward to this Flash movie regardless. Yes, I wish that they would restore the Snyderverse to some extent. There are some aspects of those movies that I definitely think could stay buried. Um, but uh, I'm interested to find out how the, this Flash movie is going to kind of revamp things, maybe reboot aspects of, uh, of the Snyderverse. Um, I, just because Zack Snyder doesn't necessarily come back and continue his original vision doesn't mean we can't have some aspect of his movies being canon, especially the Snyder cut of the Justice League, um, as it, it was just hands down a better movie. Um, definitely watch that if you haven't. Seriously, J Zack Snyder's Justice League, yes, it's four hours, but oh my gosh, is it a so much better movie than the theatrical version we got. Of course, we talked a little bit about that last week in some of the articles that we, that we went over. But this Flash movie is, uh, is set to, to be something, something substantial if all of the rumored and confirmed um, cameos and actors coming to this movie are actually going to happen. So, um, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely looking forward to finding out how this, how this plays out. So that's all the nerd news I've rounded up for today from this past week. But hey, keep hanging out. In just a second, we'll be diving into some of this week's squirrely interests. All righty, y'all. So this is the part of the show where um, I tend to talk to what I'm doing in gaming, content creation, streaming, etc. like this coming week. So firstly, you may have noticed... Uh, as I mentioned right at the start of the episode, that this episode today was released a day early. Yes, now that I understand kind of the ins and outs of how to get an actual episode posted using Anchor FM, um, you know, we've done this for real now, officially, as of last week. I think we can consistently get these things released on Sundays rather than waiting to Monday which is great for you guys because that essentially means that there's only a day delay between the day I record it and the day the episode is posted. So if, um, if you were kind of confused last week with my confusion while I was recording and saying, like, I don't know if you're going to see this on Monday or listen to this on Monday or if you're going to listen to it on Tuesday or, God forbid, on Wednesday, like... Now, that confusion should be gone going forward. Um, the only time there would be multiple days between recording and release would be if, for whatever reason, somehow, I couldn't record on Saturday. But here's the thing. like I have all the necessary means, especially with Anchor FM, um, to record this on the fly. So if, for whatever reason, I wasn't at my home desktop with my, with my decent audio setup... Um, and the configurations that I have at my desk, even if I had to do this using my cell phone, I could still record the podcast. Um, I have my OneNote file with all of my notes in it, et cetera, all of my news articles in it wherever I go. So I could record this literally anywhere if I absolutely had to and still get it posted on Sunday. So great, great, great additional free advertisement there, I guess, for Anchor FM. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, if you guys are interested in setting up a podcast, definitely check out Anchor. Uh, it definitely makes things way easier. So uh, so yeah, if you were hoping to catch me last week, folks, by the way, for streams. Sorry again if you haven't listened to last week's podcast. I did explain it a little bit, um, but I only had one stream on Monday of last week. Um, I was traveling, of course, um, that you probably know by now, right? Um, So I didn't have a stream on Wednesday as I was in the air literally during my stream time. It was a really early flight. Um, And then on Friday, uh, Friday early morning, um, I didn't stream because I was just getting home. Um, I actually got home a little early. I actually got home a little after midnight on Friday morning. Uh, so it wasn't quite as bad as like 3 a.m. like I was originally thinking. I was able to change my flight and uh, and get home a little bit earlier. Uh, so that was nice. But still, like I, was, I wasn't going to wake up four hours later, three hours later to try to stream, right? Um, and unfortunately... Like I mentioned last week, this week I will also be traveling again. Um, uh, so the same days too. It'll be the latter end of the week, Wednesday to Friday. Um, as of the time of this recording, I haven't actually booked my flight yet for Wednesday. Um, so it's possible we may still have a stream for that day. Um, I'm trying to book a flight for mid-morning, mid to late morning if I can. Uh, I gotta play with I gotta play with that in the flight itineraries and see what I can do. If I can get it for late morning, then there shouldn't be a problem with me still doing a stream. Um, it's just it's gonna be a really busy morning for me. Um, so that's what I'm gonna try to do. Still get a stream in Friday. I should be able to stream. I will be in a hotel, but assuming the hotel's okay and that Thursday night wasn't some crazy work night, then Friday morning I should still be able to fit a decent stream in. Um, so uh, so we'll be playing that by ear. We'll kind of see how the ho- hotel Wi-Fi works and all that jazz. So what will I be streaming this week? Well, the plan is to finally get on my dad's Valheim server. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, whether it's Monday or Wednesday, I don't know. Um, it could be Friday... It could be Friday as well. Sorry about that. I, I think the uh, the my software had a blip there. Um, it could be any day this week or multiple days this week, honestly, because um, because Magic Legends, I can't get to run very well on my Surface Pro for whatever reason. Like I would think that Valheim would run worse than Magic Legends just based on the type of game it is, but no, Magic Legends will almost not even run on my Surface Pro. It's really annoying, actually. Um, but but Valheim will run. It's a little slow. i got to turn down the graphics significantly. But it will run on my Surface Pro tablet. So I could theoretically play Valheim on stream in a hotel. Now, granted, I don't know how that's going to work running OBS side-by-side side with Valheim. So we'll have to play that by ear. Um, but um, But essentially, which days I'll be streaming it. So... Monday, I'll stream Valheim on my dad's server if I can figure out how to get on his server because I still haven't taken the time to do that, unfortunately. Sorry, guys. Yeah, Um, I still haven't taken the time to actually get on his server and figure that out and uh, install the mods that I need to. Um, It should be straightforward. It should be a simple copy-paste the mods into a right folder, right? Just like most other mods for games. Um, And then fire it up. He's already given me the server information, the login information, so I should... Or the connection information, so I shouldn't really have a problem. I just really wanted to test it first before stream. But, I mean, I could do that on stream, too. So... I'll try to do that mon I'll try to get like on his server Monday and and get that kind of underway. Um so Monday morning stream we'll be playing some Valheim hopefully um on my dad's server. From what I understand my sister is now on that server as well. I don't know how much they've played yet. So uh I might be doing a little bit of catch up with them. Um I honestly we haven't even talked like logistics yet. Like from that so if you're not familiar with Valheim, it's um, it's a survival crafting game, much like Ark Survival Evolved or Subnautica or even Minecraft, right? Or uh, Seven Days to Die, those types of games. Um, but it's uh, but it's very Viking. Uh, so the whole theme behind it is it's like a, it, you're set 
Um, you're set as a, a Viking, I guess, come back from Valhalla, or I don't know, I don't know. It, I, I didn't really pay that close attention to the lore, but you're dropped smack in the middle of this world, and the world is pretty vast. It's procedurally generated, but it's pretty large, and there's different biomes in the world, and um, every aspect of your skill set can level up as you use it. Um, and then, of course, there's crafting, survival stuff, elements like that. Um, it's taken the world by storm, so if you aren't legitimately familiar with Valheim at this point, yeah, you, you gotta get on. You gotta get on the ball. Uh, Google Valheim. Look into it. There are folks that I've been trying to play crafting survival games for years and years that are finally playing them because of this game. It's taken the world by storm. It's really quite interesting what's happened here with Valheim. Um, I've enjoyed the little time I've been spending in the game so far. Um, I've been wanting to play a crafting survival game again for quite some time, so I'm glad that this is here because it's making the game, making the genre really refreshing for me. Um, and uh, it's bringing in some cool elements, like the more you jump around, the more you level up jumping, right? Like Skyrim type of thing, right? And the more you chop a tree, the more you level up chopping skills, um, and so on and so forth. There's roofing elements, roofing mechanics in the game where uh, your workbench, for example, you can't use your workbench unless there's a roof over it. Like it has to be covered. It has to be a covered workbench. Um, and you can only build a base or tear down a base within so many yards of, or so many meters, I don't know what the game unit of measurement is, within so much distance of a workbench. Um, and if you watch my last stream, actually, if you watch, was it last Monday's stream, I guess, maybe? Um, if you watch that stream of Valheim, you'll see that I, um, um, I, I, re I realized, like, oh, if I want to destroy this prefabricated hut in the middle of nowhere, all I need to do is plop down a workbench, and now I can destroy it and get the free materials for myself. <laughs> so... Pro tip right there. No, not a pro tip. You all probably figured that out in the first like 20 minutes of the game. But yeah, I've been enjoying my time in it. Uh, it's been a good time. Um, and I'm looking forward to playing with my dad and, and my sister too. I haven't been playing video games with my sister in a number of years. So that'll be pretty cool um, to, uh, to enjoy that with her. So yeah... Um, so Valheim is what we're looking at. Of course, Magic Legends is always a nice fallback, um, but I can't do Magic Legends in the hotel, so we'll, we're going to have to figure that out. I don't know. Play it by ear. I might play a mobile game and, uh, and connect the mobile game, maybe. Actually, that's not a bad idea. You know what I really should do? I should see if I can use a cam link. I should see if I can use a cam link to game capture my phone. Yo, that would be pretty cool. So I've tried phone capture stuff um, in the past using like a software like MobiZen and other similar software to that. Um, and I've used um, my, my previous phone was a Samsung Galaxy S10 and I was able to use Samsung DeX um, to, to try to stream stuff as well. But that essentially treats my phone as its own desktop computer, and I can't really connect it to my Surface Pro anymore like that. Um, but it would be interesting to see what kind of streaming options I have now using the Microsoft Surface Duo, especially considering it has two screens. Um, and of course it has your, your typical USB-C output. I have seen other folks game on it. Of course, Xbox Games Pass was, uh, was first made available for Android on the Surface Duo. Um, now it's available for Android wide. But I'm going to definitely be looking into more ways to stream with my Surface Duo while on the road. That'll definitely be interesting. I'll have to see if there's, gonna, if there's any easy way for me to capture the screen output into my Surface Pro, and so it'd basically be like a two-computer setup, uh, a two-device setup for streaming, where, you know, I'd be streaming on the Surface Duo. Uh, well, I'd be gaming on the Surface Duo, but actually doing the streaming on the Surface Pro. Um, that would actually be ideal. Um, I'll, yeah, I'm going to have to look into that more. Yeah, stay tuned for that. <laughs> stay tuned for that. That wasn't planned for this prod for this uh, podcast, but um, but that's definitely going to be on my docket for this week. You can believe that for sure. 
<laughs> so hopefully also, um, we don't have many plans today, and uh, tomorrow afternoon is kind of free too. So what I'm planning on doing is recording finally those uh, the next three episodes in the series on YouTube streaming with squirrels. Now, yes, it's called Streaming with Squirrels, but it's really for any kind of content creation you want to do. The first few episodes were very dedicated to streaming. You know, what bit rate should I stream at? What streaming software should I use? But really, that software could be for content creation in general as well. And the bit rate is still some useful information, uh, even for recording, believe it or not. So anyway, so the next three episodes here, I believe I mentioned them on the first episode last week of this podcast, was that um, they're going to be all about audio. So the first, the, it's going to be a three-part mini-series within the Streaming with Squirrels series just on audio. The first part is going to be on what not to do with your audio. The second one is going to be about basic setup for your audio. And then the third one is going to be tips and tricks, lessons learned, that type of thing, and, and ways to make your audio sound a little bit crisper, a little bit better, um, a little bit more radio. And I talked a, f a little bit about some of that stuff on, a, on the Q&A section, the third segment of last week's podcast episode. So again, if you haven't watched the first episode of Stay Squirrely, do check that out. Um, I think at this point it is now available on all of the major pro podcasting um, platforms. Um, a few of the platforms it didn't get on until a few days into the week. Um, but at this point, now that every um, page has kind of been created, has kind of been created, it'd be interesting to see um, how quickly it gets on those other uh, platforms. Spotify seems to be the quickest so far. Um, it's, it's pretty much available on, pod, on Spotify like within the first hour or two of, going, uh, of getting posted on Anf Anthem FM. So, uh, so not a ton going on, unfortunately. A lot of uh, a lot of my week this week is unfortunately around traveling. You know, last week and traveling this week. I'm not traveling the following week, so hopefully um, after this week, more of my schedule will free back up. But hey, definitely check out the Patreon page for some blog updates from the road as well. Um, you know, some of those blog updates that I'm doing are available publicly, so you don't even have to uh, support and become a patron in order to see some of those blog updates. So, uh, so check that out. Um, of course, all of this stuff you can find on squirrels.tv as well. So those are the squirrely interests this week, folks. Again, not a lot going on, unfortunately. But hey, don't go away. We'll be getting into some nerd health, Q&A, and encouragement in just a hot second. Okay, so what am I diffusing today and why should you care? So I've got the Triforce of Essential Oils blends today, folks. That's what I call it anyway, the Triforce. I figure it's, it's nerdy, right? It, it, sounds, it sounds good and uh, it sounds powerful and that's what it is. <laughs> so it's a staple regardless of the vendor that you get it from, whether you're getting it from Young Living, from myself or from another Young Living rep or whether you're getting it from one of the other essential oils brands out there. Um, of course, I always strongly recommend that wherever you get your essential oils that, um, that you get something that is, uh, that is not just organic, but 100% essential oil. You do need to be careful about that on the labels. Um, not all essential oils that say that they are, you know, just pure essential oils are 100% pure essential oils. So you do need to be careful of that. Um, you can really tell with lavender, by the way. Um, just side note, rabbit trail. You buy lavender, lavender at like Walmart for like two bucks, it's probably not going to smell the same as buying lavender from one of the, the wholesale or, um, or other organizations. But anyway, I digress. The Triforce of essential, and essential Oils blends is as follows. Lemon, lavender, peppermint. Fantastic go-to blend. Uh, if you want more than just one scent, one benefit, or just you know the few benefits of the one particular oil, I talked a lot about peppermint last week and the benefits and the greatness of peppermint last week. You can also use peppermint, by the way, on your forehead to like eliminate headaches, uh, help with headaches and migraines, or on the back of your neck. Um, 
lavender. A lot of folks use lavender to soothe their skin, right? Uh, it, it's a, it's a, like a skin rejuvenator, but it can also be used as like a, as like an owie type oil. <laughs> uh, like, uh, I got a, I got a cut or I got a rash, rub some lavender oil on it and it'll help, uh, soothe. Um, uh, it'll help have a soothing effect. Uh, lemon with the citrus aspect of it, it tends to be a cleansing agent, uh, a purification agent. People use it in cleaning products. Um, people use it uh, to help with um, with aiding your immune system as well. Um, so why not put them together, right? Lemon, lavender, peppermint. That's right. This blend is like such a go-to staple for so many reasons in my household, my wife and I. Literally, if we don't know what we want to diffuse, but we want to diffuse something, we just default to lemon, lavender, peppermint. Lemon, lavender, peppermint, every time. It smells great as the combo, but you'll also, uh, but you'll always know that your body's getting some kind of, uh, you know, boost out of it as well. So, hey, folks, use this in your gaming life. You won't regret it. Of course, if you don't know where to take a look at some essential oils, you can also check out um, me and my wife. We are uh, Young Living uh, distributors, so you can check out our site at myyl.com slash squirrels. That's slash S-K-W-I-R-L-S, of course. Um, you can also find a link to that if you check out the health, the squirrely health section of the website squirrels.tv. All right, moving on to the Q&A parts here. Reminder, if you'd like priority with a question that you might have or, you know, a shout out on the episode, of course, or access to early exclusive content, remember to check out the new Patreon page, right? We've been talking about it a bit here. So Q&A with squirrels. We've got a few questions here from some of the listeners, some of the viewers. The first one here comes from Lijai, Lijai, who says, can you tell us where you go when you travel for work? Can you tell us where you go when you travel for work? Yeah, absolutely, I can. Um, I was actually going to mention it earlier in the episode, but I knew this question was coming, so I saved it for here. Um, so last week, I was actually in Charleston, South Carolina. Of course, you guys know that I'm in Delaware, right? Um, if uh, if you're in the Charleston area, hit me hit me up with a DM, and uh, and and maybe we can connect and uh, and play a game or something. But uh, well, you know, not in the Charleston area anymore. Sorry, that was last week. <laughs> um, but yeah, last week I was in Charleston. I was only there for like a day and a half. I mean, like it was wicked short. Um, but this coming week, I'm actually heading to Dayton, Ohio. Now, while Charleston was great, the town of Charleston is a happening place, super fast growing. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of cool restaurants, a lot of cool scene. The water's really nice. The weather was fantastic last week. Um, I think the first evening that I was there, it didn't get lower than like 70 degrees. Uh, we went to like a, a rooftop terrace for, uh, with like a, for like a customer dinner before the real dinner. Um, and the, then the real dinner, we went to, uh, we went to Hull's uh, Chop House, which is a very, very famous steakhouse in the country. Um, it was a good time. Great steak. Fantastic oysters as well. Oh, my goodness. Charleston, great. Like next to none. I was also born in Charleston. I don't remember it from my childhood. I was only there for like a year and a half before we moved to the Philippines. And but anyway, um, it's always nice when I can go back to Charleston. I've been back a couple times in my adult career life, um, and uh, it's a really cool town. This coming week, though, Dayton, Ohio, not really looking forward to that one. Sorry if you live in Dayton, but uh, there is not a whole lot in Dayton. It's kind of like Delaware. It's just a different state. Yeah. It's kind of like living where I live now, just not. In fact, I don't even know. In fact, I'd almost venture to say that Dayton might be less exciting. Because there isn't beaches with outlet shopping. And it's not really close to anything. Well, actually, no. I take, that, I take the last part back. Um, it is close to, like, Columbus and Cincinnati. Um, it's like an hour, less than an hour from Columbus. less About an hour to Cincinnati, maybe, give or take. Um, so it's it's a little close to some things. Um, in fact, I'm actually going to be flying into Columbus, Ohio, because I've got some coworkers and friends in Columbus. So the first night, we're going to have like dinner um, with the friends in Columbus, stay the night with my boss. Um, and we're, we're carpooling this trip. So my boss and I are going to be staying the first night in Columbus, and then we'll drive the next morning over to Dayton. 
I've got some some work that I'm doing out there at the base, um, and uh, we're going to spend the next two days on site with the customer there in Dayton. And then we're going to be flying back home, uh, back in Columbus again. So yeah, so no, I have no problem like telling where I'm going. Um, I, I sometimes have a problem broadcasting it overly openly, what days I'm going to be gone and when I'm going to be gone, just because um, I, I like to be conscientious of my family being home. But um, right now we're, we're staying with the in-laws, so it's not like my, my wife and kids are home alone. Um, without me, you know, um, so I might be a little bit more hesitant to mention when and where I'm going before, before I go, um, when we're back at our own place. Um, that might be more of like a, Hey guys, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling this week, you know, and, and, and play it by ear with that. Or it might even just turn into me saying, uh, me, me letting you know the day of, Hey, you know, d just to, to be conscientious of the security and safety of my family. Um, it's not t quite as bad these days in the pandemic world, um, just because there are fewer people outside of their homes anyway. But, um, but I always like to be mindful of that because people have mentioned it to me before, like, Hey, you know, you might, you might want to keep in mind, you know, how open you are about your travels, considering you have a wife and kids, um, and you're leaving them on these travels. So, I, I'm I'm trying to be more mindful of that, but like I said, these days um, we're sharing a home with uh, we're, we're we're staying we're being hosted by my in-laws right now at their place, so it's not quite as big a deal. But yeah, Elijah, I thank you for that question. Typically, though, yeah, no, I don't have a problem telling where I'm going. Tommy O has the next question: Where do you find your golden acorns? Great question, Tommy. Tommy, oh, great question. I find them pretty much anywhere. Um, actually, uh, a couple of years ago when we kind of first started the Golden Acorns, a lot of them I was finding in my travels. Because um, like when you go and visit uh, like office buildings and things, uh, as you could imagine, a lot of office buildings have like inspiring and, inspir uh, and encouraging quotes like just postered up on the walls or in cubicles. And I would find one that I really, really liked, and I'd just take a picture of it really quick, and, and I'd try to remember it for the next Golden Acorn. Um, so yeah, I, um, I get them in, in those trips. The very, very, very beginning of the Golden Acorns, though, I knew that I wanted to do them, and I was literally Googling them. I would Google like encouraging quotes and I'd find like an article with like 50 encouraging quotes or 101 encouraging quotes and I would just skim through them and find my favorite ones and just jot them down really quick. And that turned into the first 10 to 20 golden acorns um, with the exception of, you know, ones here and there that were from business travels. And then after that, I kind of had to get creative and, you know, then we got up to like what, 30 plus golden acorns and uh and and we started over <laughs> and we started over with the golden acorns and now we're this this coming or this past week we just did golden acorn number 14 in our reruns of golden acorns so this coming week is going to be of course golden number uh golden acorn number 15 but yeah no i get them from just about anywhere if you guys have like a, a really cool quote that you feel would be a great encouragement encouragement to others or an inspiration to others or motivation to others by all means you know um let me know in a in a chat sometime or or in a DM, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll include that on one of the uh, future Golden Acorns. Yeah, no problem. Uh, next question here comes from Prof XLR. Prof XLR, I'm assuming that, uh, that you have something to do with, with audio there with your name, Prof. But uh, this question is, why do you use a PlayStation controller instead of Xbox for gaming on your PlayStation? your computer well technically i was using a steam controller for the longest time <laughs> now i only recently moved to uh, migrated to a playstation controller uh as of this past year because right before the pandemic i finally i finally bit the bullet and got my playstation 4 um pre previous to that i only had a ps2 and wasn't even using it anymore so no, I was using a Steam controller, and to be honest, folks, I realize that the Steam controller has pretty negative and mixed reviews, but I really, really like my Steam controller. It's fantastic for mapping keyboard and mouse uh, in a game that does not have native, com native controller support. If you want to play it on a controller, Steam controller is really the best way, in my opinion. Um, 
Now, of course, fortunately with Steam, uh, you can find mappings to, uh, to controller for games that don't have native support. Um, you can find those and download those mappings, and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but I really like the trackpad aspect of the Steam controllers. So, uh, so yeah, I was using that for the longest time, and I still have two, con two Steam controllers in my possession. I keep one um, typically for travels, just in case, and then I keep one at home uh, at my desk. Uh, likewise, I do have two PlayStation 4 controllers, one for travels and one for at my desk with the PlayStation. Um, but yeah, no, I have been using a PlayStation controller as of late for uh, computer games. Um, but the primary reason is just because I don't have an Xbox. Honestly, Prof. Um, I don't own an Xbox. Now, in college, I did have uh, an Xbox 360 controller. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, I had an Xbox 360 controller in in college because anybody that had an Xbox, it was just a lot easier to have a, a 360 controller to uh, to link up to the Xbox rather than having to find a controller or share controllers. Uh, it was just easier that way. Everybody else had Xboxes. Um, so so yeah, I, like the main reason I ju I just don't have an Xbox console. So I game with a PlayStation controller. Um, but I am learning more and more and more, especially with Xbox Games Pass being a bigger and bigger deal in Microsoft Windows, especially with the Surface Duo that I now have in conjunction with the Surface Pro that I have in travels. I'm realizing now that it might be better to travel with an Xbox controller rather than a PlayStation one. I'll have to see if there's any issue playing using an Xbox controller with uh with ps remote play because i do use playstation remote play in my travels from time to time to be able to uh play my playstation while on the road you know streaming it from my home if if i can do that with an xbox controller then of course xbox is going to have much more native support in microsoft windows operating system and i'm finding that more and more with other games that are not Steam games, right? Like if I wanted to play a non-Steam game, like a like a Windows Game Store or a, an Xbox Games Pass game, if I wanted to play one of those non-Steam games with a controller, I would either have to I would either have to use a third-party software to map PlayStation controller in a way that Windows thinks it's an Xbox controller, or I would just have to use an Xbox controller. Uh, obviously one of those is easier than the other. So to be honest, prof, I might start using an Xbox controller in the future and it might not be that distant of a future. Uh, I've actually already been thinking about it before you asked that question. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But thanks for the question. Thanks. Thanks all three of you guys for the questions. Lijai, Tommy O and prof XLR. That's the last question, though, that I've got for right now. But as I like to do, you know, on the Twitch streams and as we've already kind of talked to the Golden Acorns, I want to mention last week's Golden Acorn for you guys one last time. Golden Acorn number 14. This comes from Will Rogers. Good judgment comes from experience. And a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. And a lot of that comes from bad judgment. That comes from Will Rogers. Hopefully you can be encouraged by that this week. Basically, it's a learn from your mistakes type of mantra that we're sharing with you from Will Rogers. And remember, if you ever want some one-on-one -on -one encouragement, someone to pray for you, someone to, or to, to ask me a question, maybe you want to hear that question heard on the show, send me a DM. Any one of the socials that I'm on, Twitter, Instagram particularly, are the main ones, right? But also on Discord. Uh, you can also message me through the website, squirrels.tv, or you can shoot me an email too. Uh, info at squirrels.tv is, is the email that I'd use. You can also send a voice message via anchor.fm, which is pretty cool. Check out anchor.fm slash squirrels. That's where these podcasts are initially hosted and then distributed. And it is through there that you can find all of your favorite podcast platforms with Stay Squirrely. And you can also create some voice messages and we can host those voice messages on the show. Pretty cool, actually. Um, now, keep those things, you know, family friendly, please, as that's what we like to do. But hey, that's going to conclude the show for today. Huge thanks for listening, folks. Huge, huge thanks. Please, please 
Remember to like, subscribe, review the podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. It helps a ton to get viewership and to get the squirreliness around the world. But as always, folks, stay squirrely. Stay squirrely.